This is the story of the forgotten band rumored to have outsold the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper, and the Lonely Hearts Club band in 1967. Dig deep enough and you'll find plenty of stories of long forgotten artists who had surprising impact in their day. Today I am looking at one of these vastly underappreciated bands. Their lone self-titled release and their stunning anti-drug song that was banned for appearing to be too pro-drug. Over a thousand miles south of Milwaukee, Wisconsin sits the cultural hub of Austin, Texas. In the mid-1960s, the likes of the 13th floor elevators were bandying about. Fronted by Rocky Erickson and featuring the electric jug of Tommy Hall, the group is often credited as being the first to label their music psychedelic rock. Their album came out in 1966, and traces of that new genre certainly appeared prior to the psychedelic sounds of the 13th floor elevators. But Hall is often dubbed as naming the genre. Drugs were central to the moniker, and I've talked a little bit about that in relation to that band in particular in the past. But this is not about the 13th floor elevators. Chapter 1, The Complete Unknowns. 1966, the same year The Elevators released that debut album, a band formed in Milwaukee called The Complete Unknowns. The band featured two drummers, Dean Nimmer and Wayne Will. Fronting the band on lead guitar and vocals was Jacques Hutchinson, with Rich Bianowski on bass. They floated around the local Milwaukee scene, covering popular garage rock songs of the day, and that was their style. Fuzzy guitars, a raw, gritty sound, but shortly after their first statewide tour, drummer Wayne Will was drafted into Vietnam. Will's departure marked the end of the complete unknowns, but the remaining members stuck around, and they stuck together. They just peeled off in a slightly new direction. And in doing so, they replaced Will with multi-instrumentalist Jay Borkenhagen. Chapter 2, The Baroques. With Borkenhagen on board, the band would debut under a new name, pulling reference from a genre whose traits they injected into their music, The Baroques. Many of the earlier garage rock sounds would remain with fuzzed out guitars, but the mellower Baroque sounds would also become prominent thanks to Baroque-like keyboards. And in this new sound, they pulled in quite prevalent psychedelic rock influences as well in their live performances. You had plenty of instrumental jam sessions and freakouts. Ow! No! And it was at one of these live sessions, a live rehearsal in the basement of a Milwaukee music store, that the band caught the attention of Czech Records scout Ralph Bass. Within a fortnight, the Baroques found themselves in Chess's Tarmar Studios to record some demos. Chess was known in the day for cultivating R&B and releasing albums by the likes of Chuck Berry, John Lee Hooker, Howlin' Wolf, Etta James, and Muddy Waters. The label had been instrumental in soul, gospel, and early rock and roll, and they were headquartered at the time in Chicago, a short hop from Milwaukee. Chess wanted to break into new territory, and they saw a band like the Baroques as the perfect vehicle to carry them into this new modern era of psychedelic rock. This desire, according to Nimmer, stemmed from then 26-year-old Marshall Chess taking over the label from his father, Leonard. Per Nimmer, he wanted to change some of the perspectives of Chess Records. Chess would release the band's debut single in June of 1967 for the standout track Mary Jane, backed with Iowa, a girl's name. We'll get to the controversy over the former here in a moment. But first, here's a quote from Bob Koch, who wrote about the release back in 2009 for the publication Isthmus. It's a shame the Baroques isn't better known outside of the world of site collectors who generally only give it so-so ratings, due in part to its poppiness. It's one of the more unique-sounding garage-era albums, featuring an unconventional mix of mopiness and wackiness, hard-edged guitar and subtle harpsichord, droniness and catchiness. Chapter 3, Mary Jane. Mary Jane and MJ is often, even to this day, used as a slang term for marijuana. Pair that with the psychedelic rock leanings of the Baroques and then releasing a single titled Mary Jane, and one could argue that it could only really be perceived in one way, pro-drugs. However, it was decidedly an anti-drug song. There were no pro-drugs references 
anywhere in it. Yet, within a week of its release, local radio stations banned the song for what they thought to be pro-drug references, despite it really not having any. The banning had a bit of a counter effect in the region, and they became known for their eclectic, eccentric performances and their self-titled debut album, which featured both tracks from the single, became a bit of a regional hit. This polarization would become a theme for the Baroques in the region. In a 2017 article in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Pete Levy writes, not surprisingly, the Baroques polarized listeners. Nimmer saw one DJ at a show cover his ears and scream. Another in Ohio, protesting the Mary Jane Band, played album songs on air for six hours straight. Dig into the liner notes on the Baroque's self-titled debut album, and you'll pinpoint words penned by Borkenhagen and Bianuski that their intention was not to create a psychedelic album. And that makes sense, given the pop leanings of many of the songs within. Nevertheless, it is definitely, definitively psychedelic. Oh, Mary. Chapter 4, May 26, 1967. On May 26, 1967, a lot changed, at least in terms of music. Most notably, it was the day the Beatles dropped Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. It was also the day, to much less influence, that the Baroque's debut album hit stores. You have the Baroque's psychedelic, you have Sgt. Pepper and its great influence, and the Brokes were going to struggle. Yet, in that market, in the greater Milwaukee area, it is rumored that the Baroques outsold Sgt. Pepper. Chapter 5. The Fall of the Baroques. Regional success is nothing without the ability to carry it to the masses beyond. Chess certainly had that muscle, but their capabilities were anything but rock and definitely not psychedelic. At one point, Capitol Records expressed interest in buying out the Baroque's contract, but Chess refused. Plans for a second album didn't pan out, with Borkenhagen creating weirder and possibly even more polarizing stuff. The band was unable to break out of the Midwest due to Chess not being well known enough in the rock circles to distribute the Baroques outside of that local market. Despite their growing local and regional popularity and increasing gig bookings, Chess ultimately decided to drop the Baroques. In 1968, the band self-released their second single, featuring I Will Not Touch You on the A-side and Remember on the B. Again, faced with a substantial marketing dilemma, I mean, it was self-released at the time, and additional marketing challenges through the self-releasing route, the band struggled to break out of their local market. Later that year, the band would call it quits. Chapter 6. The Baroques on Vinyl. In a one-paragraph biography on the band, albeit a lengthy paragraph at that, published on All Music at some unknown date, Richie Unterberger notes that the Brokes, quote, won't appeal to many listeners besides psychedelic specialists, but they've recorded some idiosyncratically worthwhile stuff, most of which has been reissued on small collector labels. It would be 50 years before there would be an official reissue of the Baroque's self-titled debut on vinyl. This came from the famed Garage and Psychedelic Rock reissue label, Sundazed, in 2017. Actually, it was part of the Record Store Day Black Friday celebration, pressed to 1,000 copies of electric tapioca yellow vinyl. You can grab one of these still to this day for a quite tolerable price of around $25 to $35 US. Or you can lean for one of the originals. A solid copy will run you close to about 100 bucks, if not a bit more these days. A handful of unofficial releases also hit the market over the years, including this compilation right here from 1989. It's rough, but good, and includes the, all of the psychedelic freakouts, Baroque leanings, fuzzed out garagey guitars that, well, you'd expect. Oh, and those early singles? Huh, good luck finding one for less than several hundred. Chapter 7. Beyond the Baroques. After calling it quits in 1968, the four members scattered across the United States. Of the four members, only Jay Borkenhagen would continue his musical leanings. 
as of 2017, he was still living in California. Rick Bianuski would go on to become a traveling salesman and would disappear into the ether. Jacques Hutchinson would become a communications professor at the University of Colorado, passing away in 2013. And Dean Nimmer, well, he became an art professor at Massachusetts College of Arts. Nimmer passed away in 2023, but you can learn more about him and his art on his website, deannimmer.com. I'll drop a link in the description. As for Nimmer's art background, back during the day of the Baroques, it was Nimmer himself who, in his art studies, came across the Baroque style of art and offered up the Baroques as the name for the band itself. And now let's go all the way back to the beginning, that first little statement about the 13th floor elevators. Join me as I dig into some kind of interesting things about the band. As a few commenters have noted now, this dude's a damn nerd. I am Andy, this is the Fence Post Vinyl Channel, and I'll see you in the next video.